Yes, so for, the, for the seminar, we, we really wanted to have uh, a mix of philosophers and historians and, and, uh, and scientists. So um, um, that's why uh, Vincent is here, because he's sort of uh, sitting between uh, scientists and, and philosophers. Uh, he's doing his PhD uh, in between uh, the Center for um, Environmental Sciences at uh, UH and the Philosophy Institute at um, K11. And uh, he's going to talk about us today about uh, empirical um, philosophy of science uh, in the context of a uh, project on taxonomic disorder uh, that they are carrying out. Uh, and, uh, well, that's it. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Indeed, yeah, if you're talking about a mix of discipline, I'm like in sort of continuous identity crisis. <laughs> am I a philosopher? Am I a biologist? Am I something else? I always say there's like, I don't know if you know about a beer, uh, Vedette Ipa, and it's India Pale Ale, but its slogan is not really Indian and not really a pale ale. <laughs> <laughs> like, not really a philosopher, not really a biologist. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor, of course. Uh, normally there would be uh, two of us, it's, it would be me and uh, Stan Konings, who also works at the Institute in Leuven, and who will come here uh, from January onwards, so he will be your uh, future colleague. Uh, but uh, he couldn't be here today, so it's uh, only me. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? About the idea of empirical philosophy of science, whatever that may be. Uh, yeah, we know that various philosophical disciplines uh, face calls to use empirical methods or empirical data in their research, and that includes philosophy of science. Uh, these calls are quite diverse, it comes in the name of empirical philosophy, but also, for example, uh, experimental philosophy or naturalistic philosophy. Uh, we all think it can be brought down to the same root, namely of using empirical information in philosophical research. And for some people that is uh, for some reasons controversial, they, they are like, yeah, but is that still philosophy? That's a question you uh, often hear when you uh, talk about the empirical research you do in philosophy. They might find it very interesting, but they say, yeah, but, but this is not philosophy, so... Uh, but it, in our opinion, it shouldn't be controversial, because uh, many, uh, many philosophical disciplines make descriptive claims about the world, and I mean, that's what science does as well, so uh, for that reason you could say it's uncontroversial to use empirical instruments next to traditional philosophical instruments to do descriptive work like uh, case studies and thought experiments. Uh, for example, to have quantitative evidence to support information you obtain from thought experiments or uh, case studies. In general, we believe that, yeah, to have the best chance to ever solve a philosophical problem, if we will ever be able to do that, uh, we should be methodologically open-minded. Um, of course, there's a big side note to that. It, it's not because we advocate the use of empirical research methods uh, in philosophical work that we should do all the work ourselves. There are a lot of uh, disciplines, empirical disciplines, who study science, uh, which with which we could collaborate as well, might be sort of division of labor. There is uh, cooperation, of course, with history. I think that's the most evidence. There's a whole tradition in uh, French philosophy of historical epistemology going back to the 19th century that, that yeah, did history and philosophy of science from, the, from early on. There's in the analytic tradition, the integrated history and philosophy of science movement, who also uh, yeah, does that collaborative work. Yes. Of course, sociology of science, which we, with which we can work, uh, science and technology studies. There's scientometrics, uh, often referred to now as the science of science. We try to assemble data about scientific literature and citation networks and all these things. Uh, and we find it strange that, that up to now these collaborations seem to be rare. So uh, there's an important paper by uh, Fortunato et al. about the science of science. Uh, it's mostly focused on symptometrics, but it refers to uh, interdisciplinary work on science and it refers to all disciplines studying science except philosophy of science. 
So it it talks about yeah we we, we do the digital work we, we have to work with people uh, who work on concepts like namely the sociologists but yeah I mean. We exist as well, but they, they don't seem to be aware of our existence. And this is a paper in science and it has been cited uh, more than 8,000 times, I believe. So um, there is an impact problem in philosophy of science. And we should yeah, maybe proactively uh, try to build links and, and try to work together with other science studies rather than doing everything ourselves and, and staying isolated. But the fundamental question I want to uh, raise today is yeah, in which way can in which ways can empirical information be useful in solving what are philosophical problems, whatever that may uh, mean. And I will uh, use my research or our research project as a as a test case because we've been trying to do that actually, a sort of empirical uh, philosophy of science. Actually, there's two research projects: one in Hasselt and Leuven. Uh, to which I work, uh, and then one in uh, here in the center in uh, UCLV, which is more, uh, which is hosted by Professor Penser, which is more on digital humanities. But they they like, they try to answer the same research questions and they, they fit very well uh, together. And so um, yeah, the projects are about biological taxonomy, so uh, everything that is classification in biology. The, discovery of species, the description of species, classification of species, genera, etc. Um, and, and the starting point is that there is actually uh, much disagreement in biological taxonomy. So uh, a lot of people are not really aware of that, but taxonomists really often disagree about what, which groups we should recognize as species, uh, about what species are theoretically about, yeah, I mean, about, they disagree about everything, so uh, <laughs> it's philosophically interesting. Uh, we want to know what the causes are of that disagreement, but also the consequences, because it's important, for example, for uh, nature conservation, for policy making, to have clear species lists. I mean, if we want to protect biodiversity, we have to know which species exist, but if there are multiple conflicting lists, then that's very confusing for policy makers who have to somehow pick the best list, but yeah, I mean, they're not really uh, equipped to do so. So we want to study the consequences of a taxonomic disagreement, and then we want to think on solutions of how can we reduce disagreement and try to find consensus among taxonomists or mitigate the potential negative consequences. Um, and so one question we ask <coughs> is how can empirical philosophy play a role in answering these questions? To give a more uh, concrete example of a taxonomic disagreement, there's the orchid genus office, which are really cool plants actually. Uh, they are plants that mimic insects and they get uh, pollinated by uh, what is called pseudocopulation. So the plant uh, mimics a female insect and it emits pheromones, uh, attracting uh, male insects who try to copulate with the plants in vain, of course, uh, and by going from one to another, they, they spread the pollinia. So, uh, yeah, it's really a, a landmark genus in, 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 in biology. It was also studied by, by Darwin, uh, who actually didn't believe that it, that it could work as, a, as an evolutionary strategy. So he was really uh, breaking his mind on offerings. And taxonomists are doing that as well because the different classifications that exist vary from recognizing only 10 species, so putting a lot of diversity in, in, in very big species, uh, to classifications that recognize over 350 species. Uh, so are very yeah, they are split, as they are called in, in, uh, in biology, they, they recognize every single variation as a separate species. But of course, if I have to make a conservation plan for office, then yeah, I mean, which units do I have to uh, recognize? And it makes a lot of difference because, of course, these 350 small species they have they are much rarer than the than the big species, uh, so they are much more endangered. And, and so the, the taxonomy does have an impact. Uh, and so we actually wrote a paper about uh, the causes of disagreement in office. There are many many underlying points on which the taxonomists disagree on how 
evolution works in office on how on, on, on species concepts on what, what species actually are or many value-related things to <coughs> become clear uh, further on. But so just to give you an example of taxonomic disagreement and, and how it how it exists. And so here again we want to know yeah, what are the reasons behind this conflict and how can we solve it. So to tackle this problem, not only in office but in general, we have we are used a diverse uh, methodological toolbox. Uh, we can split it out in conceptual work and empirical work that is either qualitative and quantitative. So yeah, I mean, some of the qualitative things would quali qualify as, as traditional naturalistic philosophy of science or philosophy of science in practice that is that's focused on the case studies and so on. We can discuss whether it's empirical or not, but it is, uh, let's say, naturalistic. And so there's three main yeah, research questions. We want to map taxonomic disorder or disagreement. We want to know how much disagreement is there actually? Where is it situated? Is it in certain groups of organisms or is it just in general? Then we want to know the drivers of taxonomic uh, disorder or disagreement, what are the causes, and then solutions. So you see, um, I'm not going to go into all of the research lines, but you see that we are trying to tackle this problem from a very methodologically diverse uh, perspective. I will, I will just develop one example to illustrate this. Uh, so several of our research lines focus on birds. Uh, and currently, cu currently there are uh, four global checklists of bird species. So as I said, there are different lists of species. Uh, and they are all used by, uh, by different actors, so they are, they are all relevant. Um, but there's a lot of disagreement between these lists. Uh, and, uh, okay, we want to, to understand how that is possible. Well, the first question is, as I said, yeah, we have to map the disagreement. We have to find out how much disagreement there is, um, uh, where, where it's situated. Um, but it brings uh, both conceptual and empirical questions, because yeah, what, what is disagreement actually? Uh, from when does different positions qualify as disagreement? Are there different kinds of disagreement? How can we measure disagreement? Not so easy as it may sound. How can we quantify it? And then there's the empirical part that is coupled with how much disagreement is there. So luckily all these different word lists are brought together in a, in a unique database. It's Avibase. So it's a really cool feature that exists only for birds because they are the, the best studied group of, of organisms. And yeah, it's actually a database that contains all classifications linked to uh, its own backbone so that you can compare uh, the different classifications and see how units recognized by uh, classification one relate to units recognized by classification two. Uh, well, not going to, do, to go into the technical details, but of course, if you have these data, you can quantify uh, conflict by looking in, in how many cases, how many cases, what is recognized in species differs on one <coughs> classification or another. Um, we found that there are yeah, 12,889 unique uh, things recognized as species by at least one list. Uh, we found that there's a discrepancy of more than 1,000 species in the number of species recognized. So there's one list that recognizes uh, 1,000 more species than the other, which is significant. If you have, again, if you have to develop a conservation plan, if you, if you want to study uh, avian diversity, I mean, there's 1,000 species that appear out of the blue, so it's significant out of around 10,000 species, depending on the list again. Uh, and so there's only full disagreement about 62% of uh, the concepts recognized as species. Uh, so that's data we, we now have. And we can then link that data to uh, geography, to uh, habitats. We found that there's more uh, disagreement about birds that occur in forests than uh, birds that occur in other habitats. There's more disagreement in some uh, regions in, in, in uh, in uh, Eastern Asia, for example. Uh, so that's very interesting data. Now we can start mapping disagreement 
and find we can find hotspots of disagreement that, and then uh, yeah it gives us a roadmap to, for further investigations. So here's a, uh, an overview of uh, a screenshot of Avibase. So uh, Tito Alba, the, the barn owl in English, I think, is uh, one species about which all lists have a different position. So they all recognize different populations as being part of uh, Tito Alba. So it can be visualized easily on, on Avibase. Uh, here you see the taxonomic concepts. It's not really visible on the screen. It's like a set of populations that is uniquely defined, and then you can see where, which set a list recognizes as a species. So, uh, very interesting. But so we know uh, how much disagreement there is. We can find it geographically, we can find it biologically. But of course, the most interesting question is why do taxonomists disagree so often? And uh, yeah, there are many hypotheses about that, a lot of philosophical literature that makes a lot of assumptions. Um, might be related to different views of what species actually are, because the species is a yeah, special concept of which, uh, which brings many fields of difficulties. It can be because there are different views on the role of taxonomy, and for example, whether taxonomy needs to, uh, listen, needs to uh, incorporate a view of its users in its decision making. It can be related to different methods, uh, values, interpretation, but of course, this hypothesis about the causes of taxonomic disagreement require empirical testing. Uh, ideally, we should be able to look in taxonomists' minds, but uh, <laughs> one problem is that in taxonomy in general, they provide very little uh, methodological information or very little information on their reasoning. So you need to be uh, creative in uh, unearthing their assumptions and their, their ways of thought. But there are some ways we have found. So uh, there are four checklists of bird species, but there is currently a working group of avian checklists uh, with representatives of all the lists and renowned uh, avian taxonomists that is trying to unify these four lists in one single list that should be the only global authority about bird species. And they do so by discussing all the conflicts, all the around 1,000 conflicts, and by voting on a solution, which they do uh, on the GitHub forum, uh, on that forum, they give their uh, opinions and justify it, and then uh, they vote. And they gave us access to that um, GitHub forum, so we have. Uh, so that allows us to to uh, get much closer on their reasoning because there they they justify their votes. So and that that's much more honest methodological information than than you would find in the published material. So uh, we're trying to quantify types of reasons uh, taxonomists use in decision making and in justifying their foods. Uh, here is some uh, an illustration of uh, preliminary data. Uh, you see for example that morphological evidence is the largest category of reasons so uh, that's Contrary to what many may think, that, that classification is mostly done on genetics now, but uh, it isn't. Morphology is still very important, we find. Then it's followed by molecular evidence, vocal evidence. But we also find a lot of other reasons and arguments they use. Uh, authority ar arguments, uh, arguments of conservatism and uncertainty. Ah, but we don't know. Uh, we can't recognize this as a species because we don't have enough data. That kind of arguments. Uh, so this is very interesting because we can we get insight in their reasoning and we can quantify it because there's a thousand cases. Uh, this is based based on uh, 110 uh, cases, but it's uh, our goal to have much more. And this gives us valuable information about uh, reasons behind taxonomic decision making that we would otherwise uh, not have. Another way in which we tried to um, quantify, to assess and quantify uh, reasons behind taxonomic decision making is with a vignette study. So uh, a vignette study is uh, more or less a study in which you present uh, different parts of the study population with a text that is slightly different, with versions of a text that is slightly different 
to see if the difference has any effect in their reaction to the text. So we made three uh, abstracts, uh, fictional abstracts of new, newly discovered species, uh, and we made uh, different versions to present uh, to uh, to a group of taxonomists. We had five, five, around 500 uh, respondents, so that's quite big actually. Uh, we did, for example, a case on plants, and in one version it was just a plant that was newly discovered with morphological information, and in the other uh, version there was information that the plant was probably critically endangered and in need of protection to see if they would more easily accept uh, the, the version with the conservation information, because one hypothesis is that, that conservation guides taxonomic decision making. It, in among uh, taxonomists from low income countries, as you can see here, it did have an effect. So, uh, yes, is when they accepted the abstract as, as sound, and it's much higher in, uh, for the, the, the abstract where the species is cited as threatened than for the neutral abstract. And there was also one in which it was said that it was abundant. In, probably not written at all. Uh, we also had uh, a case on frogs with uh, just a morphological basis and one version with uh, genetic data, one version with uh, habitat data, etc. to see if that extra evidence uh, leads to higher acceptance. And so so we're still analyzing the results, so can't disclose much. Uh, but it's a very interesting way, I think, also to assess uh, the drivers of taxonomic decision making and, and things that made that do make a difference in uh, convincing taxonomists of either recognizing something as a species or not. Then there's the digital humanities side, of which I don't know a lot. So if you have questions about it, I will uh, deflect it <laughs> to the expert. But um, yeah, what has been done is there's been uh, a lot of work that's been put in a corpus of 35,000 taxonomic papers that have been assembled and that have been uh, made uh, available to through SciFair, a program that uh, a program that uh, Professor Pence made, uh, which allows their analysis. And of course, this tool gives a lot of quantitative data about taxonomic literature that can support traditional case studies, which are much more restricted in the scope. We can see how in this uh, corpus that is, that is thought to be representative about how taxonomic effort is distributed. Are there more papers about, let's say, uh, bird taxonomy than about insect taxonomy, <coughs> etc. We can look for uh, patterns of methodology and of species concepts. We can uh, yeah, look for virtually anything in this. Uh, so this will also prove uh, promising uh, tool in the future to, uh, to get to know more about taxonomy and to answer the research questions. And then there's of course the solutions part and we, uh, we have told that there is a lot of uh, disagreement in bird taxonomy, we have told about lists, we know how much disagreement where it is situated, we know the drivers of it, um, but then we have to do as philosophers also yeah, a bit of normative work of course. Uh, and here too, the working group which votes on uh, taxonomy is very interesting because, yeah, I mean, is it justified to just vote on scientific controversies? Not everyone accepts that. And certainly in taxonomy, which is a very uh, individualistic discipline uh, by origin, it can strike as strange that they are now, let's say, politicizing uh, the work by just uh, resolving all controversies and all conflicts, which are often uh, of long date uh, by a vote. So and that's, of course, a normative question. We've now uh, finished the paper in, we've, in which we've uh, analyzed that question, because voting was and is used in several other cases as well uh, to settle similar conceptual and classificatory disputes. Uh, we've analyzed these to see whether it could work in taxonomy as well. Uh, there's the delisting of homosexuality as a mental disorder in the DSM by the uh, 
American uh, Psychiatrists Association in 1973, which was a hugely controversial vote. There's been the vote on the definition of plants in 2006 and the planetary status of Pluto, also a controversial vote. And there's the common use of voting uh, in geology, in uh, the building of the international chronostratigraphic chart. So all these yeah, geological time units, they are set by voting. So it's very interesting to see how that works and, and what we can learn from this example. We, in general, defend the use of voting with some caveats also for taxonomy. Uh, so that to illustrate how the descriptive and normative work does uh, interact in our research. So that's of course the whole thing about voting is a conceptual normative work, um, and and you could you could present the idea of empirical philosophy like that. Okay, we do uh, first some descriptive work in which we apply empirical methods, uh, and then afterwards we do conceptual work on the normative part. Um, but we. Yeah, I believe that there's also some empirical work that can be done in the normative park, mainly in the testing of normative principles of solutions and in bringing uh, normative work closer to science because it's also an observation we do a lot of, we make a lot of normative claims <coughs> in philosophy of science but they are rarely uh, followed by, by, by science itself or put in practice. So there's a problem there as well that maybe uh, and precisizing our normative work in some ways uh, can help to solve. Uh, one example, so uh, our project is also run in, in uh, Hasselt University and uh, the zoology lab in Hasselt is specialized in flatworms. I don't know if uh, <laughs> people are acquainted with flatworms, but they are, yeah. As the name says, <laughs> small ecoskip. I, they are also big flatworms, mostly the, mainly the parasitic ones, like the flukes. Or, or, uh, but anyhow, they are worms. And uh, one of these worms is uh, Geratix hermaphroditus, which is a species complex. And there's been, uh, so it's currently recognized as one species that is uh, cosmopolitan that can be found virtually anywhere in the soil of aquatic uh, ecosystems. But since the 70s, there have been papers saying, yeah, but this is more than one species. We need to split this up uh, because there's an awful lot of variation uh, within it. But no one has done it until now uh, because they didn't dare to because there weren't enough data. Uh, so very strange things. So more than 50 years of we need to split this, but it has never been done. And there has been research in Hassel that has found, that has tested different taxonomic methods for hieratics. Uh, and using morphological data, they found how ah, we need to split this in uh, 15 species. Then they used a uh, genetic method, and that said, I don't know, we have to split this in 62 species. And then there's uh, another genetic method, and that said, no, no, we need to split this in 78 uh, species. Okay, well, what do we need to do now? It's a very big uh, problem, of course, because, I mean, what is the best, the best split we can make? And the traditional approach, approach that, is, that is currently popular in <coughs> taxonomy is then to say uh, we need to do integrative taxonomy. That's a new uh, fashionable thing in taxonomy, uh, mostly as a, as a means to save an like, essentialistic, monistic taxonomy. If we integrate all these conflicting data, then we will come with a unique solution. But we have various philosophical and conceptual problems with that integrative taxonomy because, I mean, it never specifies how they are going to integrate uh, data and the way in which you do, of course, impacts the outcome. So actually, it's, yeah, it just pushes the problem uh, forward. Uh, you have to make choices because there are conflicts between the taxonomic methods. Uh, it's a bit an illusion to think that if you just draw it uh, all together, then so but now we want to use our philosophical critique of integrative taxonomy uh, to try to solve this problem uh, and to come to a split that will be that is sensible, that is philosophically sound, and uh, that will be accepted by the rather small but still uh, existing uh, 
flat one community. Uh, and so we are now working on that, but it will be really, uh, <coughs> it would be nice if we could use our conceptual work in the actual taxonomic work and publish it in the biological paper. Uh, so that's our goal here. And then that way we can test our philosophical solutions for uh, or alternatives for integrative taxonomy. Uh, testing in a sort of way our normative our normative work to see if it works uh, for a difficult case like uh, chaotic semaphilitis. The same with offers. Uh, so yeah, some people agree that if we if we can't agree on a single classification, then we should uh, use digital tools um, to make the relations between all conflicting classifications more clear, a bit like uh, Avi Base does. Because as I said, Avi Base only exists for <coughs> dogs. Uh, so for many other groups, we, we, we have no clue of how different taxonomies relate to each other and, and which species of the one belong to species of the other or of, do they overlap or uh, And so taxonomic alignment is now uh, being developed to, to, uh, uh, to build these relations. And to, uh, so we're supporting that conceptually, but we also want to test it uh, for office. Uh, we want to try to build uh, such a taxonomic alignment and find out the relations between different office classifications as a test case for our conceptual views on taxonomic alignment. So that's another way in, uh, in which we try to uh, empirically test our normative principles. But this is all real philosophy. As I said, that's a question we are regularly confronted with. Many people, they accept our methodology for solving this taxonomic problem, uh, but they argue that it's not really a philosophical problem, it's a scientific problem that we're trying to uh, solve, and while empirical methods may be useful to do that, um, it is not empirical philosophy because it's not philosophy at all. Of course, you could ask, uh, do we care if this is philosophy or not? Uh, maybe we shouldn't, and maybe that's just it stupid question, there's no real value in having the predicate of philosophy. Uh, the question is whether we uh, try to tackle a societally relevant problem. But of course, if you say, oh, no, I don't care whether this is philosophy, then you can ask the question, yeah, but are we philosophers then the people who should get paid to do this work, or are there uh, people that are better qualified than philosophers to do it, if it's not philosophy? Uh, of course, if you, if you frame it like that and if you see the problem of taxonomic disorder or disagreement as a purely scientific problem, then uh, you can relate that uh, question to an existing debate on what is referred to as uh, philosophy in science. There are some people who argue that we should do philosophy in science, like use philosophical methods to solve scientific problems, rather than doing only uh, self-interested philosophy on science for our own agenda. But there are other people who say that philosophy in science is no philosophy, so that's a, an ongoing debate in literature to which uh, our questions here relate, actually. Uh, one observation, of course, is that taxonomic issues do occur quite prominently on the philosophical agenda. Um, so that's an argument to say that it's not a mere scientific problem, while it is also a scientific problem. There is a lot of philosophical interest in taxonomy, and mainly about the concept of species. So there has been a lot of yeah, philosophical work done on the concept of species, on what they are ontologically, are species kinds, but some people argue that they are individuals. Uh, are they natural kinds or other types of kinds? Uh, and on the other side, on what species are biologically, are they? And that relates to the so-called species concepts like the biological species concept, which says that species are reproductively isolated groups of organisms. You also have an ecological species concept that say that species are uh, groups of ecologically differentiated uh, organisms. There's phylogenetic species concepts which link species to history. So uh, any others? So there's two ways in which the questions of what species are can be, can be asked. In a, tradition, in, a, in a way, these are very traditional Socratic, Socratic what is X questions, what are species, it's a 
questions Socrates could have asked if he would, if he would have been interested in biology. Uh, and so one question we can ask is whether these questions are useful uh, to solve the scientific problem of taxonomic disagreement, the philosophy of in science perspective. Is our work on philosophical work on what our species useful for the scientific side? And then we can ask the question, yeah, is, is all this empirical material uh, that we have assembled, is it useful to answer these traditional Socratic what are species questions? Let's first look at uh, the role of conceptual work in solving the scientific problem, the philosophy in science perspective. One observation is that species concept, whether they are implicit or explicit, when, whether taxonomists reflect on them or apply them implicitly, let's say, do play a role in taxonomic decision making. So ideas of what species are, which may be uh, made explicit or which may be not, do play a role in delimiting species. That's, that sounds fairly evident. You can't describe species if you don't know what species, if you don't have an idea about what species are. So that seems a place where philosophy can play a role, namely in engineering these concepts and saying yeah, the concept of species you use there is not fully consistent or it's not fully applicable in that context, etc. Um, another finding of our research is that taxonomic research processes are guided by many uh, values and assumptions that are often that often remain implicit. Another role philosophy can have is in making these values and assumptions explicit and in guiding debates on their legitimacy and on trade-offs between them, uh, debates with which taxonomists often struggle. Uh, so that's another role philosophy could have in, uh, in solving the problem of taxonomy disorder. And then there's of course a normative side of things. What does the best uh, possible taxonomy look like? It's, it's something philosophies of science can reflect about. It's, it's our job. So philosophy can play a role, in our opinion, in improving taxonomic research practices. So to answer the question uh, of whether philosophy can contribute uh, to solving uh, the problem of taxonomic disorder, whether it is a philosophical problem or not, is in our view, yes. And then there's the other side of the question, can empirical data inform conceptual research? Uh, and can it be useful even for the philosophical agenda, uh, the very metaphysically framed what are species questions? We also think, yes, because yeah, one important thing in my view why, why species concepts and concepts of species, uh, which is a different thing you could say, are concepts and are ideas. There are concepts that emerge from scientific practice. If we wouldn't have science, we wouldn't have the concept of species. So if you want to understand that concept, it seems more or less evident to, uh, yeah, that you need also to understand the, the practice. And I think that also counts for the philosophical agenda. I, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to do species-related metaphysics in the void by just not referring to science or biological reality at all. So I think that's a way in which our empirical work can be useful for the what are species questions, also philosophically. And another observation is of course that in scientific practice Concepts are met with a lot of practical constraints in their application, in their operationalization. I mean, you don't use a concept directly, you have to operationalize it. If you use a biological species concept, so which says that species are reproductively isolated groups of organisms, you have to find ways in which to assess whether groups of organisms are reproductively isolated. So there's a whole, a lot of, yeah, operational work to be done to put concepts in practice and these that side uh, these constraints these practical constraints in our view are very difficult to capture with purely conceptual work so you do need empirical work on the functioning of taxonomy to get into that side of the problem and then as I already explained we uh, find that normative solutions as well are met with a lot of practical constraints they do need to be uh, operationalized to be used uh, and knowledge about scientific practice is vital to produce yeah, sufficiently uh, 
concrete normative principles that, that are workable. And that relates again to the, the question of impact. Eh? We, we, if you want our normative work to be used, we need to uh, link it closely uh, to the scientific reality. So these are uh, reasons to believe that our empirical data is useful for conceptual work, both when it is aimed at the scientific agenda or when it is aimed at the philosophical agenda. I think uh, to illustrate the same thing in, uh, in another way, uh, I think the, 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 the science of taxonomy or the, the discipline of taxonomy illustrates very well how there is a gradual flow between concepts and scientific practice. We have concepts but the way in which they are used in practice uh, is through a flow of, of practical considerations and constraints and you need to understand that whole spectrum from a concept to a formal taxonomic scientific decision uh, to understand the problem. Uh, and again, I think that's true for both the scientific agenda and the philosophical agenda. And of course, to understand that whole flow from concept to practical decision, you do need uh, conceptual and empirical work linked together. So, uh, just to end, we observe that many people in our centers, and that's both for the Nouvelle Neuf side and for the Leuven side, there are people uh, who are exploring the use of, of empirical philosophy in their work. Uh, so we think there's, that it's time to reflect on how we can formalize and support that tendency. How can we, for example, share methodological knowledge and resources on uh, how to do empirical work, uh, things like this vignette study, it's, it's not really easy to design such a study, so you do need a lot of methodological information. If we can pull that together for, uh, I mean, it's not really productive if everyone finds that out on, on, on his or her own. Uh, so maybe we can pull knowledge uh, within institutes and share it. How can we promote uh, collaboration with other science studies? Another important topic, I think, because as I said, it's virtually inexistent now. Can we provide funding for empirical work? Will we be able to convince funders of philosophy to fund empirical work within philosophy? That's, I'm not sure of that, so we should reflect on how to do that. Um, we can, for example, also invite well-known empirical philosophers as a way to promote, uh, promote it. And I think we also have to reflect on how to incorporate notions of empirical philosophy in the education, because uh, if you really want to be this to become a thing, you need to uh, make students enthusiastic about it and get them acquainted with uh, empirical philosophy. So it might be included in some courses. It might be seen as part of uh, philosophical skills even we, that we uh, teach. Uh, there can be a seminar on empirical philosophy, I don't know, for MA students. Uh, so these are just some ideas on how we can amplify this tendency, which uh, in our view is useful. Uh, and that's what I had to say, so I'm interested if there are any questions, if anything was unclear, or if you have uh, more opinions. Uh, awesome, thank you. <laughs> we very often do, and since we have time, shall we take a five minute break? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, all right. Reconvene is fine.
really a naive, but maybe not stupid question about um, do, do, do we need a taxonomy the way we did it? Because usually, the way I understand taxonomy is kind of classification with class and subclasses, but maybe this is not the way we can modelize it. Maybe you can think in terms of networks with correlation between species. Um, it can be useful too in order to measure biodiversity. Maybe we don't need a precise list of species. Of course, it's easier for a politician to think, oh, we have so many disappeared species. But I think we can build strong indicators uh, without necessarily using glasses. Or, I mean, maybe not, but I would like to address the question because maybe we can be more fundamental about this. Yeah, I, I, I agree that we should be open <coughs> sorry, about whether we, how, how much do we need to care about the traditional way in which taxonomy is done, the, the, the system which goes back to Linnaeus. Uh, and there are many other ways to uh, characterize biodiversity. I, I, I agree with that, and I, I would, as a philosopher, I would be also be fairly radical. I mean, if, we, if taxonomy is, isn't a good system, then we just need to get rid of it. But of course, again, we can <laughs> say that as philosophers, well, but uh, taxonomists generally are very conservative, and most biologists are conservative in the way in which they perceive <laughs> classification and. Uh, biology, so these calls to radically modify or change or replace the system are very met with a lot of uh, hostility. So I do think that it's useful to, uh, to find less radical ways to improve the existing systems. But there are interesting philosophical uh, cases that are made to abolish the rank of species, for example, uh, because now the system is built about the species being something special. Uh, you could just say, yeah, no, we have we have a biodiversity that can be grouped in different uh, groups at in groups at different levels, but there's no need to find one level that is special, for example. But even that is very uh, negatively uh, met in a <laughs> biological audience. <laughs> so I would be careful with uh, radical proposals. And also, yeah, I mean, we can we can find <coughs> ways to characterize uh, biodiversity. We can just, uh, if you want to, uh, let's say that there's an area in which we want to do a development, and we we want to know how much biodiversity there is uh, to see if we need to protect that area or not. Then we can just uh, <coughs> go there. We take some samples from the environment, from water, for example, or soil. We sequence all the DNA and. We quantify how many uh, genotypes are present uh, without knowing to what they refer necessarily. They, do they represent species? Do they represent unknown species maybe? Uh, so that's a perfect way to do it, but of course you... Will, will that be enough to get the biologists on your side? Or will that be enough to get the, uh, the policy world on your side? Who, is it enough to make policy on genotypes, or do we need like some sort of natural kinds to have them legally represented? That I'm not sure. But I think morally and legally, uh, there is a, a desire to have sufficiently elaborated <coughs> and formal species that are uh, to give them moral standing or to give them legal rights. Let's say in, in conservation, you need uh, sufficient grounding of the units you use. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. Yeah, yeah it's an answer. I have a follow-up. I was wondering, is, is that the rule of philosophy to make some critics about the main concept in science? And may, maybe that would be the difference between a pure empirical scientist analysis and your, because you can say, OK, uh, here can be an answer with species, but we can also have a critics about the concept of species. Yeah. And, and you involve more epistemic notion. I don't know if it's part of your of your work, this this kind of critique. Yeah, it is. And but of course it's it's a political choice of what we say to biologists and what we say to philosophers and what we publish in philosophy journals is more radical than what we publish in biology journals. That's <laughs> that's a political thing. So but yeah, we do it is our explicit goal to be normative, uh, to criticize what needs to be criticized. And, um, 
and to, to improve taxonomy, that's, that's the end goal. And I, but yeah, it's, it's uh, maybe anecdotal, but so I'm, I'm doing my PhD partly in, in Hasselt, in the, in the zoology lab, where I'm uh, the philosophy guy, that's how they uh, refer to me. <coughs> um, and I, I did criticize some of their work. There was, uh, uh, they were writing a, uh, a research proposal for the FWO, it's the, the Dutch uh, FNS, and I uh, uh, thought, yeah, but we are going to have a discussion about it, and I, I give my, my criticism on that project, and in the end they didn't submit it, so I was uh, <laughs> Socrates who destroyed the whole project. <laughs> so yeah, you have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt really bad <laughs> because my contribution was very negative, but yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so of course we do have the aim to be critical because that's what we are as philosophers. But there's a, there are political and diplomatic limits in how you apply that in scientific practice. When you're doing what they call a philosophy in science, you have to uh, acknowledge the feelings of scientists as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question about the. Uh, yeah. Because I think I didn't understand uh, what you did. And uh, were you trying to say that uh, when there was a conservation uh, worry, they tended to, to, say, to judge that it was a new species? Yeah, in this case. But actually. Uh, because I feel like it could just be probability thinking. That is, if you find uh, a new species and there is a lot of uh, examples of that uh, in the, uh, species, I mean, it's unlikely that it's a new species. You know, it sounds just weird to discover something that is very common. I don't know. So maybe it's not That could be an, an explanation. <coughs> Do that. Do you see what I mean? Uh, like just a number of things, yeah. maybe not conservation. But in the, in the non-conservation version of the abstract, uh, there's no reference to how many okay. there are. But usually, if it's threatened, threaten, there are less items. Oh. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I feel like maybe there is like a prior probability thinking, mm -hmm. like the prior probability. But you could also say, yeah, I mean, if there are only a few individuals, it, less, it is less likely that it's a fully new species, it might be a variation of something existing. No, so you could, could also that you turn the argument. Uh, no, because it could be that you didn't find enough, uh, that it's likely that you have no chance, you have no chance to discover it before. Uh, yeah, it can, it can play a role. But so the, the idea here was that it's a, it's a common hypothesis in philosophical literature about taxonomy that uh, conservation, conservation plays a role in taxonomic decision making, which many taxonomists say, oh no, no, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not the case at all, and, and that's not legitimate. Uh, but actually, uh, so we wanted to test that hypothesis, or that assumption, that, is, that, that claim. Uh, and so that's why we made uh, one abstract, so which is neutral, one in which is explicit on uh, there is no extinction risk, and one which is explicit on there is a high extinction risk. But actually, for uh, high income countries, there wasn't uh, a difference. So the, the hypothesis is falsified That's really for high, mm -hmm. but for low inco income countries, which is a lower, uh, a smaller uh, sample, there was. Uh, I'm just thinking maybe it could be interesting to distinguish between the threatened part and the smaller num number part. To see if it's different or the same. Yeah, that would be probably interesting as an extra test uh, uh, to see what the dynamic. Uh, mm. Because there are some people that have thought about that in, uh, you know, they, uh, I don't know what to explain, but uh, the fact that sometimes you don't have all the space, you have missing data, and so you make assumption based on that. So if if something is threatened as a species, it's possible that it's threatened, but it's also possible you're missing some data. Yeah, that's so interesting. It would be interesting to test. Uh, 
Yeah. So I think in general, because our sample of, of high income countries is high, there is no uh, effect mm, okay. of uh, these different abstracts, so that it doesn't matter. I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Thanks for clarifying. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm interested in the metaphysical uh, modification of what you just said, or ontological modification. You said that metaphysical science was uh, stands on marginal reality and on scientific practices, and I agree with that. I think we've talked about that uh, when we were in Ghent. But now I'm wondering what uh, you think, uh, how you view metaphysics in your projects, because I think you have a great case against like, a more realistic or fundamentalist metaphysics. Because if you talk about taxonomy, and taxonomy is there's disagreement among scientists and you have to uh, and the practices and you have to uh, stand on that. Either you have to resolve the even collective two options are just voting to choose one taxonomy or be pluralist, and in both cases you're not describing uh, the fundamental reality of it, right? You're saying how you project yourself in reality. So it seems to me that your pro project metaphysics it seems more conscient. Or more like a non-realist, the, 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 what the way we do metaphysics usually in science, at least. So I was wondering what's your thought on that. Yeah, I would I would argue that we are not uh, fundamentally uh, anti-realistic, uh, but um, our main tenet would be that there are many ways in which uh, the real world clusters in uh, kinds. And that the kinds that we uh, actually work with are dependent on what our scientific aims are, on, on, on our values and assumptions and our scientific aims. So uh, we have to be nuanced about. Uh, we are not pluralists or relativists. We say I mean, any classification is useful depending on, on what we want, and we can just vote on it. Uh, no, but there are different sensible ways in which we can classify reality. Um, there are also ways which aren't sensible. Uh, but to pick among the many sensible ways of classifying reality uh, is a context-dependent, value-dependent or goal-dependent thing. Uh, and that might uh, include uh, voting or, or, let's say, less scientific or traditional scientific uh, methods. If we go back to the to the office case, there are, there are these hugely discrepant uh, classifications, but arguably they are all uh, delimiting or targeting some sort of natural kinds, these 315 microspecies and the 10 macrospecies are all natural kinds, but they are based on different ways to model reality or to uh, different yeah, emphasizes that are, that are made. If you uh, say, ah, we want species to be reproductively isolated groups and you are uh, recognizing kinds that, are, that have a reality, that's it's not something we invent, they are uh, reproductively isolated groups in the world. But if you uh, just use morphological groups, for example, you can get different groups, but they are as real as so there is a, a realistic constraint on the way how we perceive taxonomy, but there is also pluralistic. Uh, I don't know if that. No, I uh, answer that is when, when, when from the metaphysics, metaphysician doesn't say that it's realist and that is the way. I agree that's a good way to do it, but uh, and it would be hard for most people to understand that as being metaphysics, or realist metaphysics, because if you're saying that the natural case depends on what you want to do. It's, you're not describing like, the fundamental reality of the world, it's kind of going how you see the fundamental reality, or how, how you see reality uh, from a certain point of scientist, which is perfectly fine. But yeah, maybe we have very open minded ways of thinking about metaphysics. You know, I don't uh, care much for traditional sensibilities in metaphysics, but uh, yeah. Thanks. I have to agree that the aim of our our project is not metaphysical, so we haven't really uh, gone in depth on, on that side of the issues. But I do think that our results are useful for a metaphysical debates about species. But that's for metaphysicians to uh, 
to decide in the end whether they want to use it or not. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, so this is obviously empirical philosophy, but um, it's not empirical about the world, right? It's empirical about scientists. I mean, of, of, of course also about the world. <laughs> scientists live in the world. But, uh, <laughs> it's not um, like half philosophy, half biology. It's more like half sociology of biology and philosophy, at least from the way you describe it. But it seems to me that to get this project completely uh, uh, off the ground and, 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 and very productive, you also might need to do actual biology work, uh, test certain features of plants and so on. Um, or would this really be a completely different line of research? Because you know, if I understand I mean, well, all the, the, the empirical data you have is just what scientists are doing and what they are publishing and so on, never data about the world, well, about the biological world. Yeah, well, it, it's, that's maybe because of the emphasis of this presentation. That we we uh, fundamentally see it as philosophers of science and then our study object is science and indeed not <coughs> the world as studied by science. Uh, so that's why, why uh, all these things are in need about, about science. But we do use uh, the biological data as well when we are, for the flatworm project for example, I mean we, we work with actual flatworms in the lab uh, to test our, our work and uh, for office as well for the alignment. Uh, so it is, it is our ambition to. Uh, and how exactly do they, those two, uh, where is the biology work? Exactly interesting because, like in this pluralistic idea, then because it because the biology one is the most important constraint on, on your concept, and uh, if you want concepts to work, then they should fit with the biological reality. That's I think the most important way of our ethics are not just the way scientists are talking about reality, yeah, but also need reality need itself. Both yeah, uh, I think that's fundamentally important. I mean, we, we uh, so yes, no, that that is uh, uh, a central part of our research or of what our research should be. Of course, this uh, doing biological research is more expensive, and, and uh, so to to get our actual new data is it's not always easy. But should be uh, an equal part of of our work. Uh, yeah, maybe and that didn't become clear emerge enough for, from the presentation. I agree with. Could there be a sort of threat if you want to do both in the sense that if you look at science and you kind of see like this is uh, for scientists more important apparently as what happens for classifying uh, then you're sort of neutral uh, you have this like perspective from the outside and you can like investigate what their logic is well if you're like, in it yourself too then you might want to push more the biology direction you've developed into. Like if you're a genetic, have your genetic, a genetic background, uh, then you might have a kind of bias that is not justified by the project itself, but more by your background and by the school you're in, towards genetic classifications. You know what I mean? You, like the neutrality of the outsider position who looks at the scientists, or well, philosopher or well, uh, sociologist seems to have some advantage too. Yeah, I, I agree, but I I mean most of the people on our project aren't biologists, so we do have that distance by nature by not being a biologist. Uh, I, I studied a bit of biology, so I, I could maybe be uh, biased. Uh, but the others uh, are much less. 
and I, I but I, I do want to emphasize that by getting more closer scientific practice, it, you you can make better criticisms by knowing how it actually works and by with these with these data these data don't bias us they but they allow they give us yeah, sure, sure. more I reason. Agree that, yeah. but it's, it's different I mean maybe it's in practice not different but, but like conceptually it seems different to be close to, to know like practice very well or to know the domain very well. Like you know that seems to be a at least theoretically different idea um, you can, in principle, study scientists like they're bees or something very carefully and know very well the behavior of these bees. Whatever it is they are studying, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. they could be like solipsistic, or the, like studying nothing at all. They're doing something and you're studying it. Um, or you could like very well know, like have an object uh, knowledge or relation to, to, to the thing they are studying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that it's a relevant distinction. Uh, but I would then argue that you need both kinds of knowledge to, uh, to reach the goals of this project uh, in full. Uh, and that relates to our uh, semi-realistic, semi-structuralistic view on how the constraints of reality and how the practice of scientists uh, fused together in, in uh, a taxonomy that, that somehow appears. So I do think then that if we accept that distinction that both kinds of knowledge are and that we uh, like I agree in the knowledge of the domain itself that there is a risk of bias but I don't think that that risk outweighs the, the advantages of yeah, having biologists uh, and having biological knowledge. In, uh, and of course, we are a project with people from different backgrounds, so that gives a protection against uh, biases from all mm -hmm. uh, directions. We have, uh, you know, one of my advisors is an actual platform taxonomist, so he, uh, he brings in a different knowledge, but indeed he's let's say that his normative views are covered by his... <laughs> his opinionated, his opinionated guy. Decade long <laughs> <laughs> work in taxonomy. Yeah, in the good one, in the good one. Yeah, you want that. Yeah, you want that. I hope he's not watching. You don't want unopinionated, <laughs> you don't want unopinionated uh, uh, biological colleagues. That's not helpful <laughs> if you're a philosopher. Mm -hmm. But so we need, yeah, you need, you need the balance. Uh, but his knowledge is actually quite valuable, even if it's Quality brings in a lot. Yeah, no, of course I don't. Uh, so I don't disagree at all. I, I would add, would add maybe uh, perhaps you, you can correct me, but um, being an outsider on, on, on your project, uh, because you you mentioned that if, if they start doing the experiment themselves, it might become um, well driven to to prove or defend the one of the opinions that before they were integrated was just another opinion and they were neutral to it and now they would sort of embrace it more. Um, for me, I, I, I would just think that the, the, the neutral position doesn't, doesn't exist. No. Even, even, even in this point now, right? And this, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but at least by being in this project, working together with, with the biologist, there's the common assumption that solving the taxonomical disorder is a good thing, uh, right? So that, that's, that's already a way in which they, as outsiders, are actually positioned. So I, 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 I would question whether it's possible to, to in any way be, be, be neutral. I mean, I don't think it's super uncontroversial, but, but in, in a way... It's not, I mean, there are many taxonomists who say, I mean, it, we don't care at all whether our work is unusable by users because we are so often disagreeing. These disagreements are important, and if we stop disagreeing, then we stop being sound science, and we don't care what policy makers. No, no, but I, I mean you and, and the group we, of, we of 
fills a position in that. In that yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what I, I think it's, 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 it's rich, but not a detriment that, that you have a position which is, right, at least at the very least, that the assumption is that solving the, the taxonomical disorder is uh, a valuable thing. Um, and, and, and related to, 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 to this, um, I, have, I have two questions, um, which is uh, when you were talking about the bird, um, the many databases of, of birds, right? Um, that there's a lot of disagreement between them. My, my immediate question was why is there disagreement and, and could the context in which those databases are used um, explain some of the disagreement? For example, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, um, but are there um, local, more local or regional databases um, aimed, are they all aimed at conservation or are there some that are not uh, conservation specific databases but are more just like I don't know, bird watchers or aimed at, at professional taxonomists um, and, and would those uh, contextual differences help explain that difference? And then my, my, my follow-up question to that would be, um, because it's something that, that you talk in your talk, but I think it's never explicitly addressed, is why should we solve the taxonomical disagreement? And it's not a rhetorical question, but like, why, um, why is it important? Is it because we are aiming at having a sort of um, a, a, a global database in which um, global policy making can, can happen. Um, so, so why is, is according to, to, to the project, important to, to address this, this, this agreement? Yeah. So on the first question, yeah, the, the context in which these lists come into be is probably important in, in shaping them. I think even, even just the people who are uh, in the commissions that write the lists, they, they they are, they are quite small groups of people, like, let's mm -hmm. say, those are ten, 10 people who, who make such a list and who decide on uh, the on the list. So, so even these individuals have a, have a big influence on, on the end result. There will be elements of tradition, because, yeah, I mean, how are these individuals recruited? Yeah, they are probably not going to recruit someone who is fundamentally, methodologically different, than, because mm -hmm. then... That, so yes, that, that would be an, another area to investigate the, let's say, the historical context in which the existing lists have uh, come into being, and we haven't uh, studied that. So uh, that would be something uh, that could be done. Uh, we are hoping to do that for the uh, new list, the unified list. Uh, so we are doing this quantitative uh, part, but we also would like to uh, interview these people and, and wider sort of history about how how there came calls to make a unified list, why, why were there uh, demands for having a unified list, etc. How did the process, yeah, how did the process go? So, but yeah, it's still running, so we can't write uh, history as it's being made. Sure. Uh, but it would be uh, very useful to do that for, for existing lists as well, with uh, mm -hmm. time constraints. Sure. Uh, you know, <laughs> On the second question, why do we want to solve the problem of taxonomic disorder? Yeah, because uh, taxonomy is used by a lot of people who have certain demands of clarity and stability, both within biology. I mean, all biological research, almost all have to be correct, is structured around species, and uh, so they want there to be one catalog of species. Most conservation legislation is built around species. Uh, in, in, uh, in the US you have the Endangered Species Act, which is all about the uh, protection of species. In Europe it's a bit different because you have the, the habitat guidelines, well, which uh, focused on habitats. But yeah, there, it, there's a, let's say, a societal demand to solve the problem of taxonomic disorder, which we recognize. And uh, because purely philosophically, there is no need to. Uh, maybe then I'm becoming uh, 
overly pluralistic and relativistic. There is no need to have one single list of species, even if uh, they would exist in reality. But it's a, it's a societal demand to have uh, a stable and clear catalogue of life and, and society looks to taxonomy to provide it and, and taxonomy isn't providing it. So I think that's the motivation. Uh, but as I said, many taxonomists don't feel that they have to provide that stable and clear catalogue of life. Mm -hmm. They say that's not our job. We describe uh, biodiversity, we do it in very different ways. Uh, so they wouldn't recognize that demand. But we do because uh, just to follow up, what is it called? Uh, is it you calling it a disorder or is it, what is it called disorder? No, it's uh, a term that Stan, the colleague who uh, wrote the project, invented. So, we, so why? Because you could say it's a segment or...? You have to ask him. I, I, Did he st I thought maybe he stole that from a biologist, uh, though, I, yeah, think. I, think I think. That's, I think that's a quote through. from a bio, from one of these from a taxonomist. Because I'm a sort of philosopher of medicine and it's quite up an air that is all the time of the segment of what's the disorder. Oh. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not intended to have any medical <laughs> connotation. So we, uh, it's disorder in the sense of There's no order. My, Confusion. Uh, yeah. my desktop being disordered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of terms that are being used, like taxonomy, there's taxonomic anarchy, uh, taxonomic. Yeah. So they are like metaphor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the exact like etymology, I, I'm not a... There's like normative elements to the... Yeah, to that's the true. Yeah. But we do have that fundamental methodology, uh, view that some aspects of taxonomy disorder at least are bad from a societal perspective. Yeah, and that's if, if I can follow up on, because um, when you speak of, of societal demand, um, what, what comes to mind is like um, precisely how those, those, those databases are actually used, right? Because so if, if I understand um, some database might have, for example, a bias towards, um, let's say, I don't know if this is the case, but US birds, for example, uh, and another one might have a, a, a bias towards identifying um, birds in lagoons, near lagoons. Um, but if those databases are used in those contexts, the fact that in the, the, the database for American birds has, it's used in the US for US regulation, um, shouldn't be necessarily a problem, right? Yeah. Like the same way that, that this university is organized in a certain way to, to follow certain functions, let's say it, 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 it follows those functions and it does it well. Um, another university splits the philosophy department as, uh, closer to the biology department and this one closer to the, the literature department. It, you can say that it follows certain functions, but that the fact that we're not, we have a, uh, organizational disagreement is not necessarily um, a problem because they have they, they they answer local needs and local functions. So and, and that's why I asked at the beginning about the, the really the function of these databases, how they are yeah. used, um, whether locally um, they follow that function. Right? I would, yeah. First, I would argue that in most cases it is just not clear what the organization or fundamental principles behind specific databases or lists are. So it's, mm -hmm. we don't know okay. uh, what biases they have or what, what, with what aims in mind they were explicitly or implicitly constructed. So that would be one thing we need to assess. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, all these lists have uh, laid claim to universality. So right. It would, be, it would be a whole different story if taxonomists would say, yeah, this classification is context-specific. It is specifically constructed with these aims in mind based on these uh, methodological principles. But that's not what they do. They all claim that their classification is the 
correct classification. It should be uh, context independent. So, uh, yeah, and third, um, that's something we might criticize as well. The demand of society, of policymakers, is not to have context specific classifications, but to uh, have universal classification. That might be wrong, but that's. I think is, that what, is that what the policy yeah, makers demand? Yeah, makers want species that exist, and if we. Uh, any caveat that we make might, I mean, if you take a relativist position and say, yeah, these species, they are, they are constructs, then they would say, oh, well, but we don't have to uh, invest money to protect constructs, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, and also, uses of taxonomies, they don't often reflect on why they use which list or database, they just take the first thing, find the data, so. <coughs> Should that all be different, then, then yeah, it might be right that we should indeed use built context specific lists, use them in the right context. That would be ideal from both science and uh, society. There's this desire for universality that is okay. actually, actually quite strong. So, no, that, that's 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 nice. So even just currently, the bad part of this disorder is not the side of uh, philosophical interpretation of it. It's the side of people mistaking, mistakenly uh, taking the taxonomy to be universally uh, defining uh, reality. So it is uh, certainly not a problem in philosophical speaking. It's a problem of communication and how they are not explicit. But there are, there are pragmatic, pragmatic reasons to give uh, the taxonomy and not just. Uh, yeah, they are. But the problem, yeah, the problem is you. We think that there are uh, that there is a universal list of species, and then we find that there are actually many lists of species, and that conflicts, of course. If, if, uh, yeah, but uh, as you said, uh, philosophically speaking, there is no issue as, as you recognize that it's pragmatically uh, inclined. There is no issue, philosophically speaking, to just say well, the constraints that pick with one uh, or the other taxonomy is just what you want to do with it. So yeah. from the philosophical side of side, I don't see the bad thing on this disorder stuff. No, that's, that's true, I agree. Uh, a, a die-hard essentialist would say that, philosophically speaking, uh, taxonomic disorder is a, is a problem because what scientists and do is metaphysically unsound. I don't agree with that. So, No, the, the problem of taxonomic disorder as a problem is only societally uh, relevant. That, that I agree. But I do think that it is maybe not a problem in philosophy, but it is interesting for philosophy okay. because it challenges. I mean, the whole mess of taxonomy is an important challenge, challenge let's say, and, and stress test for metaphysical accounts of kinds and classifications and universals and species and, and whatever. So, I mean, it's not a problem for philosophy, but it's relevant. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say, you had a second question, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah the second question. So I'm, I'm, I'm a logician. I wonder what, whether you could, whether there's anything in, in interesting logic being done, uh, or whether it could be done even, on such voting concepts, uh, because they, they seem very interesting. And, and to some extent, it seems like the, I'm of course very biased, uh, the, the, the usual of such a project, because you want to solve disorder, and solving disorder, that's mainly creating a functional logic to cope with, uh, with, 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 with concepts that seem incoherent. Uh, so, so has there been any formal work being done in, in voting concepts? I mean, concepts that are the results of voting? Um, and, and how would that work? It, that's kind of a fuzzy logic, I assume. Uh, well, not, not in this context. I think there's little work on, on the use of voting in science, actually. But of course, there's a lot of logical and, and mathematical work in voting theory in normal yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so you can, I think, fairly easily apply that to this. Uh, but in my knowledge, to my knowledge, that's not yet been explored a lot. Whether how how that would work out in, in science? I'm not sure that the voting theories are going to do much because what you really want here is. Um, 
sort of semantic approach. So your idea is like is like a is 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 working like working with the concepts that result from voting while taking into yeah, account yeah, the true. fact that they have come into existence yeah, via a vote. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you have, uh, I mean, something is such a species if it aggregates, uh, um, I mean, the right kind of evidence par parameters, uh, and then doing a vote over that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you almost you almost could imagine trying to get people to adopt something that would feel kind of that would be kind of paraconsistent in the sense of like like. But we have to be yeah, sure. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, but it could because you could get to you could get to weird cases where like. I don't know. Uh, I can't get to a I can't get to a decent example where like where like the voting the, the like the majority voting results in concepts that look like A and B, but then there's a certain kind of inference that you take from those two concepts where actually, when you unpack the votes, like the what were otherwise the minority votes combine in such a way that it's not the inference yeah, yeah, that yeah. you would expect from A and B. It's actually a different inference. Yeah, so Arrow's uh, uh, theorem and paradox and so on, that, that's, that's the kind of problems you get. Okay. Uh, because indeed, coherent uh, theories that are then voted over, uh, often you get an inconsistent uh, a theory out of it. Uh, uh, like yeah, but voting does not conserve uh, internal structure and internal. Yeah, that's that for sure. So they. they when they started the voting in the in the Avian Working Group, they said, "Oh, we're not going to uh, use, we're not going to vote on a species concept or a methodological principle. We're just going to vote on a case by case basis." But then you get, of course, inconsistent outcomes. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes, in some cases, they will interpret uh, evidence in favor of uh, splitting, while in other cases, they will. Uh, so and they're then becoming aware of of that because now during the process they're saying ah but don't we need theoretical guidelines to ensure at least a degree of consistency? So it, that is certainly uh, a problem. And I mean you have small majorities sometimes, so you do even if you would apply these guidelines, you would get inconsistent uh, outcomes. That's the price you, you you pay. But of course the semantics of the concepts you get. Out of voting, uh, you could say that that yeah we need to do a lot of work on, on what these concepts as results of voting actually mean. But of course, in another way, their meaning is already fixed because they vote on conceptual designs which are already yeah yeah sure existing in a debate. We, we but then you have to check which inference rules and so on that gives. But you can still <coughs> do with a science that is based on that are defined in this way. So yeah. I agree that qua semantics, the work is kind of already done. But it doesn't, it's not clear to me at least what, 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 what kind of like aggregated picture this gives in terms of inference rules and so on that scientists can use. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I think uh, no one knows. <laughs> and it will become clearer when, uh, when the list is ready, I guess. Uh, but it's an interesting topic for further study too, because we can we can I think fairly strongly defend the use of voting from the perspective of existing taxonomic disagreement and problems it brings. But indeed, for future work and whether the outcome of voting is can be used in, in future inference, and that's a that's a more question to, to explore. That's a good transition. That's, a, that's actually a question that I, I wanted to, I, I just wanted to get you to say a little more about the voting, about the voting results. Because it seems really cool. Um, so what were your, you mentioned you, you, you'd gotten some kind of rules of thumb about like, like what made the, what made the, the voting in the taxonomic cases defensible, whereas in other cases it might not work so well and like some cautions. So like, what did, what did some of that, what did some of that look like? I don't think I've heard about that project yet. That's really cool. Yeah, I, we just submitted the. Oh, so I can I can uh, share it as a, a 
it's a preprint. Um, yeah, the basic the basic idea is that whether whether you need uh, there's there's a basic trade off in concepts between uh, the fact that we need to use the best possible concepts in science and that that can only be guaranteed if there is conceptual debate and criticism possible. And on the other side, we need to use ideally the same concepts in science because we need to communicate, we need to collaborate. So that's a trade off. Uh, a fundamental trade-off, which is very apparent in taxonomy, because all taxonomists want their concepts, their species, to represent something about the world and to tell something about the outcome of evolution. And that's that's mean that's an, if that are difficult scientific questions which need debate and, and, and criticism to uh, to be solved. But on the other hand, in biology, we want to use species as means of communication, a means of storing information. Of stable uh, use of inference. So that, that is a trade-off in our view. And in some cases, uh, that trade-off should be resolved in favor of uh, the communicative side of the matter. If, if these conceptual debates become regressive, which they tend to do in taxonomy, and they become like heated arguments with always the same uh, arguments that are repeated, then they can say, yeah, this conceptual debate is becoming aggressive. Uh, there will not be a natural consensus because the different people in the debate have different values and preferences. And, and then it might be, uh, but that's of course something for the scientific community itself to decide, there might be uh, best to resolve the trade-off in favor of communication and to uh, use a system of what we call conceptual governance, in which a scientific institution sets a conceptual standard that is ideally followed by. Uh, so that's the first part of our argument. And the second part is indeed that voting might be the best way to uh, do that conceptual governance, because if you install what we call conceptual governance, it should be done in the best and most democratic manner. And there are reasons to believe that voting systems are most suited. An alternative would be sort of system of deliberative democracy where you put all people together in a room until they uh, find a consensus. But I mean that we think that uh, finding a consensus with a time limit leads to uh, all things are like coercion and power dynamics. I mean there's literature on that. While voting uh, has a double advantage of solving a conflict rapidly because you have a, dir a direct resolution all while signaling a disagreement. If the votes are really split then it's clear that if there is disagreement or uncertainty so you, you have a, a valuable measure of disagreement all while solving the problem. So that's one of the main advantages. Also if we acknowledge that different positions in conceptual debates are guided by different values and preferences then, I mean, voting Voting is the system to aggregate between conflicting values and preferences, you can't deliberate yourself out of it. Of course, if you think that there is one rational optimum, then deliberation might be better. But we, we think in these cases there isn't, like, uh, in the case of homosexuality, whether it's a mental disorder or not, that's not, that's a value, a value value-based question. The definitions of a planet even mean there the different positions where people from different sides of astronomy with their own research interests and, and the concept of planet they wanted depended on that. So that's not there wasn't a rational optimum. And we believe in taxonomy in, in many cases there is because there are many sensible positions. So then voting seems the best way to uh, to enact conceptual governance. And then the rest of the of the paper is about how to ensure that it's accepted because mm -hmm. you need <coughs> strategies. Mm -hmm. That's what the case of, of the APA and of Pluto learned that, that if you they improvised their voting systems, they were like, oh we're having a conceptual crisis, we're quickly organizing the vote. I am simplifying now with that. And then of course there was a lot of criticism on process.
while in, in geology and stratigraphy it's, it exists since long time, it's well established, um, it's much more accepted. So we, we, we plead to use voting, but to use it in a way, uh, in an embedded way that is, goes together with communication about why there is voting about. Uh, yeah, I mean, with strategies to increase the legitimacy. But we haven't reflected indeed on the whether the products of the voting are actually usable. Uh, that should be a following up paper, I guess. And if I may have a further question, did you study the bias with the system of votes? Because I guess Sorry? That, uh, when you implement the votes uh, for, for the scientific, uh, to, to resolve scientific disagreements, did you study uh, how the bias of how you implement the votes? Bias of the knowledge that you have before? I mean, is there a preferred system of votes? Like a majority of million stuff, or like a, take a majority plus one, or take whatever sort of vote. Is there one that is rationally better than the others for this kind of disagreements? Uh, I don't know if I get your question fully well. Okay. So, for, uh, I, I, it's the same question as you have in the question of the, the, how you elect democratic list or someone. There is always a bias in the system of vote that you implement to get the vote. <coughs> so, I was wondering if there is one system of vote that is better for scientific disagreements. But that leads you to more probable, more useful uh, resolution in the question of how people are accepting the, uh, the vote or how closely to the truth you're getting. Or yeah, we haven't reflected on that in detail. So in working, in most cases, they use simple majority voting. Okay. And I don't feel that there are obvious reasons why there were more why more complex systems would be uh, better. There might be you could say yeah, we need. 60% majority, uh, yeah. I, I don't know whether that would help, but it might, of course, bias. And for example, in the in the uh, BERT uh, working group, uh, the votes are open, so they're not secret votes, which is the mm -hmm. we would uh, advise against, for example, because it can again lead to power dynamics and uh, they vote in an order, but if, if all the others have uh, already voted to split, then that might influence your opinion to, to might make it less attractive to go against that, for example. So there are uh, some conditions which you can think that <coughs> good voting system should honor. And if your argument against the races is against is, is the existence of parties, <coughs> you have to do secret votes. But, so yeah, we do have some. I dis but on the actual voting systems, we, I don't see a big problem with simple majority voting. Uh, if there are really uh, multiple designs available, then you could use a system of alternative voting, for example, where you rank the options in preference because some you might be uh, for one option and prefer another as second and be against one very specifically, but yeah, in most cases it's, it's a binary uh, choice and then a simple majority of what is, uh, seems fine. Yeah, that's interesting, that does seem to be, I don't know if it's, is that in, in the Abbey base case, is that on purpose that they only try to have yes, no votes, or do they ever present like, here's four ways we could split, what does everybody think? Uh, was that a... They, they, they do have votes in which there are more options, and then it's first past the post. Uh, but it's actually rare. They do try to present the conflicts in a way that makes it binary. Sure. Sometimes they split up uh, more complex cases to have binary choices. It's probably easier to yeah. know what you think. Yeah, of course, because if you have multiple options and the first pass post system, then the majority has become very small. Yeah. So you might again get legitimacy. Uh, and in many cases, even if there are more than two options, the votes tend to crystallize about the choice between two options, and some options are just ignored. So sure. Sure. Uh, and that's probably guided by the system of simple majority. I was wondering what you think about another possible motivation uh, for, for voting being a good option. 
uh, which I presume you won't like it, it's not realistic at all, uh, but I would like to know your opinion about it, namely uh, that like, there, there really is um, a natural kind behind uh, species, behind the word species. Um, it's just that we don't know it, uh, like we have no access to it or not yet. Um, and all these different uh, approaches to biology are also all trying to get at the real concept of species. And there's like as an assumption that they approximate it, but that they are not there yet. And so, like uh, scientifically, if that would be like the assumption, the metaphysical assumption, then a scientifically justified project would be to just like, okay, we don't know who's right here. Uh, but somebody's right, and uh, uh, the, the bigger groups are the ones who, uh, who have probably more members, and therefore I mean, they, they, have, they have been more convincing. And so maybe they are already closer to the reality. So let's just vote uh, who is in the majority, and, and, and then uh, not judge, try not to judge all our groups, but, but like get to the most likely approaching of the truth. Uh, I don't know what you I, 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 I agree. There is, there is political theory who justifies <coughs> it's, it's called the epistemic democracy, uh, the, the Condorcet theorem, and, and he said, yeah, um, we need voting not because we have different values and preference to aggregate in politics, eh? uh, but because everyone has an idea about what is a societal, uh, the societal optimum, but we can be wrong about it. But statistically, it's more probably that the majority is right, and so we have to vote because the majority has the biggest chance of being epistemically right. And the first way in which we framed the voting thing was, uh, yeah, we don't have to care about whether species, about whether we are realists or nominalists, because if we are realists, we use the running of epistemic democracy and we say yeah taxonomist the majority of taxonomists is probably right about what the actual natural kind is and if it proves out that nominalism is right then we have our uh, social choice theory about aggregating values and preferences and so we had this double grounding of voting uh, for reasons of simplicity because we also want uh, the paper to be uh, able to read by people using voting, we have, we have removed that <laughs> discussion. You are a deeply pragmatic person. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just how you talk after you try to submit to biology journals five or six times, <laughs> and just get absolutely incinerated by the peer reviewers, and then you start to talk like this. This is just, we all, we all get here after a while. Um, but also, be many, uh, I think many political philosophies would be uh, would see it as wrong that we just yeah throw all these political theories on a, on a together and say yeah in this context that justification of democracy works and in that context another works because they are yeah in, in political theory they are opposed and they, they, they are yeah let's say seen as incompatible so if we so that's also a very pragmatic use of political theory in our uh, justification of voting. So there are, I think, conceptual problems with uh, the double structure. But that was how it, so I do, I do, I am sympathetic to, towards epistemic democracy. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> I didn't expect you to be. Uh, but, uh, sorry, and I well, conditionally sympathetic. Conditionally sympathetic. If you're going to be a realist. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I like conditional sympathy. But, but you gave another picture of realism, right? Where, where all these are other uh, uh, natural kinds, and I mean, we just have to use one of them, uh, but all of them refer to a natural kind. Uh, yeah, but that isn't, that isn't predefined in the vote, so the vote actually is both about aspects of reality and about aspects of values, mm -hmm. because all options in theory are available to vote on, and there are some options which should be uh, voted against for reasons of, of uh, constraints of reality and there should be other 
options that should be voted against for reasons of values. So fundamentally, I do I do believe that we should throw epistemic democracy and social choice theory together. But I haven't, <laughs> let's say, it's, I haven't enough acquaintance of these theories and of their uh, sensitivities in, in political theory to to confidently do that, and, and because they are seen as oppositional by many, many. So maybe it's we are we are too fast in, in, in bringing it all together. But I do. I mean, you do have a strong case uh, for voting if you can argue that voting both works for you in a realist context and in a nominalist context. Uh, but it, it would take more work to clarify, uh, to, to uh, clear out the uh, Could be decided the details. by votes. Uh, like in so many contexts that works better, and in so many contexts that work better, and you just uh, find out what is the majority of contexts best working, uh, and then you decide which is to switch. That is also yeah, you could, you could vote on. I, I presented the voting uh, thing in a, in a conference in, in Germany, and one of the questions I received was, yeah, we can, as philosophers, argue for conceptual governance in science, but would it actually work in philosophy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, didn't, I didn't have an answer to that, so we might, because there are a lot of conceptual debates, in philosophy as well, which do hamper communication, that's my view at least. Within philosophy, maybe we all have our ideas about what concepts mean and maybe we should indeed govern that and set collective standards and vote on that. But is there a societal demand for, for <laughs> philosophers to get their, their governance together? I don't know, we should organize a survey to <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, is there any other questions? Because otherwise, uh, yeah, good. we can yeah. uh, no, no for more uh, uh, have yeah. the next one uh, uh, outside. Uh, Perfect. Beer or Thanks so much.